Yeah, thank you, Stefan, for introducing me in such a kind way. I will continue in German, if you allow, because that was agreed with the ITB convention. Um, and our panel will be also in German, but with simultaneous translation. So, ladies and gentlemen, the definition of luxury for hundreds of years has been pretty similar in dictionaries. It's regarded as what is more than necessary, more than what we need on an everyday basis, more than the bare essentials. Of course, tourism wants us to experience new things, something special. So, even a normal traveller, if you're not a day labourer from Nepal or Iman or Qatar, is luxury. To be served, to see new scenery, to be looked after by things. This is what tourism advertises with. I'm a consultant. I get around the world quite a lot, and I have to say that often it's a farce. You come into an idyllic fishing village and you discover a concrete jungle. And the fishing boat is from a database and the boats are all made of plastic and the view of the sea has been obstructed by a lot of plastic umbrellas and peddlers. And that beautiful sandy beach that was advertised is more or less covered by people. The crowd around the hotel buffet, unlike your canteen back home at work is uh, probably no better and maybe worse, including in terms of the food quality. So there might be an environmental label on the wall, but the rubbish bin is full of plastic beakers. So luxury is often sold, but we're talking about a mass product, and the concept of luxury is changing a lot. Probably a lot of people will remember mobile phones used to be regarded a luxury, but nowadays you're an outsider if you don't have one. Perhaps you could state this quite simply by saying that if something is rare, it's expensive, and not many people can afford it, and then it's luxury. But these days, if you look at authentic experiences, starry skies, views without cars getting in the way, without a Starbucks and supermarkets. These are rare these days. That is luxury. Of course, it's expensive. You've got to be able to afford it. So the question is, can it be sustainable? If this is in remote places where you have to pay a lot of money to get there and the infrastructure isn't there, so how can you enjoy your stay in these remote areas? I've heard touristologists often claim that hotels with high occupancy rates are more luxurious than ones with low occupancy rates. I don't know. I think that's a bit of an academic argument because well, they say that sustainability depends on high occupancy, but I don't know because that's going to generate more rubbish, isn't it, and use more water. So what is more sustainable? Energy-saving light bulbs or what? I need to talk to practitioners about this, so I'm delighted that we have such a, an exciting and diverse panel here with a lot of people whose background is very diverse. So we have Miss Reed Miller, who's come here specially from Zanzibar, so a little round of applause for her because she's come the furthest. Ms. Reed Miller gets the applause not only because she's come a long way, but also because she is a kind of jo Pope Joanna of ecotourism. I've known her for a long time, and uh, sh she founded something, the first private protected maritime zone in the world. And I think it's the best looked after coral reef in Africa, Chumbi Island. I can only recommend it. It's very beautiful. So that's enough advertising. I'm also delighted to have Alejandro Castro Alfaro here from Costa Rica Tourism Board. He's come from a country which is also a long way away, and he gets applause. He comes from a country which has subscribed to sustainability, where the whole agenda is devoted to sustainability. It'll be interesting to see how they run luxury tourism there. Then we've got somebody who sees all this from a very different perspective, who has the dream job. He travels the world and 
scrutinizes luxury lodges all over the world, and that is Hitesh Mehta from HM Design, which is an architectural practice, and and uh, let's welcome him too. And so that we can focus a little on our theme, Sibylle Miller has brought a little film clip from Zanzibar to show how beautiful it is. There you've got the website, there's plenty of information and a lot of prizes have been won as well. Before we begin with the panel, let me look at the first question for the audience before I go on to the background of our panelists. We'd like to ask you this, can exclusive luxury tourism in nature reserves be sustainable at all? You might take the view, no, nature reserves should be left untouched, then you can press one. Or you might say, yes, exclusive luxury tourism can help to protect nature reserves efficiently. That's number two. Or you can say, no, I am opposed to this kind of thing, so press button three. You've all got a little device like that by your chair. So when the music is on, off you go. Okay, now this is also a good voraussetzung for the. So that's a good start, I think, for today's discussion. Everyone seems to be pretty much of this opinion. Well, two thirds, anyway. Let's try and thrash out the truth. We need to use microphones. Yes, you have one. I'm going to start with Ms. Riedmiller, because we've just seen your film, Ms. Riedmiller. You represent one of the most award-winning ecotourism projects that I have ever come across worldwide. And uh, you've done a lot of award hopping from one prize to the next. So how did that happen? What's your background? What made you hit upon this project? Heard man? Yeah, heard. Yeah. Okay. As I've been inside. Well, I came in through the back door, really. I had nothing to do with tourism to begin with. I was a development aid specialist, and in my earlier life, I was involved in uh, development projects and working for GTZ and UNESCO, GTZ being the development agency here in Germany. Got to Tanzania, was involved in education projects there, and I was enthusiastic about sailing. I loved that kind of thing, and I got to know the coral reef and I loved it. I fell in love with it and spent all my free time there. But unfortunately in Tanzania, the, they use very unecological fishing methods and these destroy the reefs. They use pumps. There's no awareness there. I talk to a lot of fishermen and for them the corals in Kiswahili, there's no word for it. They just call them rocks and stones. So they were always pretty cross when well, they, when they use their pumps, it would completely destroy the corals. They, we would get very cross about that because they would be completely fragmented. So we wrote a report for the government in Zanzibar and proposed that they needed to have an environment program on the coral reefs. The whole island, Chumbe, consists of corals. You'll find nothing in school textbooks about this. It was a huge lack of awareness about the environment, and there was no tourism in those days. And therefore, there was no lobby for the corals. So you decided to develop tourism or what? 
No. I thought a marine park for children, for educational purposes, where kids can go snorkelling. Most Tanzanians can't swim. You have to teach them, and you, so you need inflatable jackets. And people who live on an island can't swim. Good question. I don't think so. OK, I'll withdraw the question. Well, women would have to get undressed, and in a Muslim society, that is not acceptable. So from the outset, you weren't really thinking about tourism. You wanted to protect nature. Yes, I was thinking of a marine park, and maybe the government could set one up. And the idea was, it was completely unknown. There was no such thing as a marine park in Tanzania. Nobody knew what I meant. Nobody understood it. The Zangiti, Kilimanjaro, and so forth, all fam familiar natural <coughs> parks. But uh, there was no interest at all, so I thought, OK, I'll do my own then. And I decided to build a marine park. I had to finance it to do that tourism. But the purpose was environment education, so that children, people in general, found out about the coral reefs. I went out with the fishermen around the islands, first of all, to find out where a park might be, that, where the coral was still not, hadn't been bombarded into to death and were still healthy, and where children would be able to do their snorkeling and dive, and where tourists could get to, which was appealing for tourists, and I found my area. So you do this, children snorkeling and local people taking part in environment education programs, yes? Yes, I had no experience with tourism, and my first business model wasn't luxury tourism. Uh, I had was able to draw on government experience with the park. It was very complicated because there were no laws, no rules about how you go about it, and it meant a lot of negotiating with the government, and then we had to develop that. And because it all took so long, and because of the eco-architecture, we developed a nature protection area, both in the woodland and in the reef, and obviously wanted a state-of-the-art architect, TU in Braunschweig helped us, and they, I have to praise them, they did fantastic work, to develop an architecture that was would have zero impact. With uh, composted toilets and uh, all of it is very sustainable, and solar heating, for, of course all that cost money. And I have to say that our business model was then very quickly ripe for the dustbin, and I was working in the luxury segment. And we just had to get down and do with it. We had to rethink our marketing policy, and it was uh, pretty exciting, dramatic. So so what does a night cost? $280 a night per person, including the transfer, the food, and all the tours, and the guided snorkeling, the trekking. And so... What is, what's the reaction when you tell people what it costs? Well, I have to say, we are competitive, but, but nobody competes with us. I attached a lot of importance to design. It's all very beautiful, and we've done all this rigorously green, and this is constantly stressed to our guests. We look after them very carefully, of, of course. the. Um, it's, you have to teach them how to use the compost toilets and things. We have to teach them to manage the aroma process and so forth. But it all works. And I have to say our experience was that the reaction of guests, sometimes they were surprised, but usually they ended up being really enthusiastic. So our most important feedback was is from TripAdvisor. You'll probably be aware of that. Is a kind of guest ranking site. And from the outset, we've always had top ratings, one, two, three. Although we only have seven bungalows and uh, there are 170 hotels in the region. So this five-star satisfaction is our main marketing argument. We never went for the luxury market, but value for money, that was the price. And people seem to think it was a good idea. So we do very well in this market. For a lot of people who are enthusiastic about green issues and sustainability, it is still quite a high price. 
it's certainly uh, Tanzania is nevertheless quite expensive because of all the natural parks and you have to pay to get into the park. So if the bungalows are not fully booked up, you can come along for a day's tour with the snorkeling, the food and everything. You can do that for $90 and that's a bit of a buffer zone, if you like, for people who want to come along. People often come for a day trip and then they say, oh, I'd like to spend a night here too. It does happen. And uh, that's partly for marketing purposes that we offer the day trip. So the compost toilets are part of the luxury program. How else could you describe the luxury? What, what is luxury for you? There are seven bungalows on the whole island. So the island is 90% woodland. So there's a limit on that. Yeah, it's exclusive. And what's also exclusive is that we have the coral reef. We're the only ones that can go there. There are no boats that go out there. We're the only ones that can go there with our people. So it's extremely exclusive. And that is the condition of the nature protection zone. So we can exclude people and it's a private island. We can do it. It's a private reef. We manage it on that basis. That was the aim of our negotiation with the government. It didn't take, it took a while because to start with, nobody could imagine what we wanted, but it's, it is private property and you can, organize that contractually. We call it marine conservation agreements. And we set an example internationally for this kind of thing, this private marine park idea. And uh, it's proved the test of time. So things are working well for you. You have a fairly simple product, if we can call it that. And the luxury is defined by the fact that you don't have a generator rumbling in the background. What about waste? What do you do with waste? We have banished plastic. There's no plastic on the island anywhere on the island. Well, how do you do that? Well, for showers, we have rainwater. How have you managed to ban it? Ban it? Well, we tell people and we collect in the, the bottles. No, we take the old wine bottles. Water is filled into those. You can put that in the bungalows. It's filtered water, which we put in wine bottles ready for the guests. And we also offer them the chance to take their plastic shampoo bottles with them. So everything that we have is organic and uh, the compost toilets work because they produce compost and then we can use that for the next stage of a compost toilet. So it's all composted, it works. Well, I was a bit surprised that uh, at the ITB, uh, Chumba's here but you don't have a stand. But you don't need a stand here at the ITB, do you? It's a matter of costs. We don't have the money for it. OK, so luxury tourism is also a matter of costs. Right. So I'm going to ask Mr. Alfaro, what about you? You, you are per se a kind of eco-tourism destination per se. I tried in advance to get someone from Palawi, which is the, I think, marine conservation side. You've got... You've got the tropical rainforest, I think. Do you have compost toilets and things? Or what products do you have and what are your strategies? Experience regarding sustainability. Uh, we have a lot of ecologists. Actually, 80% of our hotels have less than, than 40 rooms, uh, which make us uh, quite sustainable from the start. Uh, around 26% of our national territory is protected by uh, national parks and around 6% is present protected by um, private reserves. So we're, in that manner, sustainable. Also, regarding electricity, we don't uh, need to mind much about this because the national electricity, uh, around 95 to 99% of our electricity comes from uh, renewable sources. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things from the country are already sustainable, uh, but also the, the business people, the government, um, and a lot of NGOs that we have, we're very passionate about sustainability, sustainability and we think that is, this is the way to do business uh, in Costa Rica. Um, regarding the, the specific examples of ecologists in Costa Rica, that, that's something that we, we also uh, have a lot of things in common. For example, we also compost, uh, we recycle. Uh, a lot of people, uh, for their amenities, they don't use uh, plastic, uh, they, don't, they don't use plastic, plastic straws. Actually, there's a provider in Costa Rica that does uh, like bamboo straws. Mm -hmm. um, 
so we do have all these practices within the lodge also. And some of these ecologists they have solar panels, and they rain, they harvest rainwater. They don't have a air conditioning, and, and, and still that's luxury also. Uh, just being there in the middle of the rainforest, having this fresh air, I just recently produced oxygen, uh, and um, taking care of the environment, uh, it's, it's something that is very important for, for the clients and for the, and for the business people. Um, so yeah, all these practices are very common in Costa Rica. And also something that is very important is that once we visit the national park, uh, rainforest, we have rainforest, but also cloud forest and dry forest, which are very interesting also. Um, you need to go like with a guided tour, make sure that you understand uh, the place, be respectful with the place. Uh, you just can't enter and be very loud and, and throw your garbage there. You're actually entering to an ecosystem and you need to understand it uh, with a guide and, and make sure that you're being respectful with the environment also. Something that is very important for us also, it's all the environmental side, it's, it's, it's crucial and that's something that we do take care of also. But we also take care of a lot of, of community. For us, community is a great way to develop uh, economically uh, impoverished areas. So uh, these uh, ecologists and, and hotels in general in Costa Rica have, um, have a great relationship with the, with the community. And it's a great way for us uh, to take care of the, of the economic side uh, and the society. Uh, we should remember that sustainability is not only the environmental side, it's also the community. Uh, the social side and uh, the economic side. It needs to make economic sense uh, for, it, for it to be sustainable. Mm. If not, uh, it could be a very nice initiative, but uh, sooner or later it could die, right? Uh, so for us also, the community work is, is crucial. So for example, our ecologists, they try to hire mostly, like, our, more than 90% of their personnel is local. Um, additionally, they work together with the community. They have environmental education programs. Um, they have a, also studies within the, within the the lodge. We have a, some lodges have like a little school or or a, a training center for the community a, to be able to give a high quality service. Also, so we need to be sustainable. We need to comply with all the luxury. A, 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 experience and having a great service is crucial also. So uh, teaching these skills to the community and making sure that we could have uh, the community being part of this uh, touristic experience is crucial. And additionally, um, sourcing from the local community and sourcing from the, from the, the as you call it, the farm to table movement, uh, it's important. So there's a lot of, of these uh, ecologists that they actually compost all their waste and, and uh, they use that as a uh, fertilizer to have uh, an amazing uh, soil to grow more uh, vegetables, fruits, mm -hmm. and everything. Costa Rica is a tropical destination. We have all sorts of fruits and vegetables, so our, our food is very healthy, um, and all these ingredients are amazing to experience right from the, from the soil to your mm -hmm. table. Wie wird das umgesetzt? Gibt's da gibt's da Kriterien? Ähm, gibt's eine, eine Are there criteria for that? Is there a policy from the government, a standard? It's wonderful if it's all done on a voluntary basis, but uh, maybe you don't need to bother with that kind of standard and law. Actually, it's it has both sides. A lot of they, they, we have a certification that actually um, ensures that you're complying with sustainability. Um, efforts and that you're doing all sorts of, of different practices in your in your hotel or travel agency or, or any touristic uh, company, uh, but also this is voluntary. We don't we don't. Uh, um, it's something that the business uh, takes the decision in a voluntary way. So it's not something that that we we need to. You need to operate in Costa Rica just if you have the certification. You can operate with other certification, but we do recommend uh, you having it. But it's a totally voluntary um, decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this certification has been going on since 1997. So we've been certifying uh, sustainable tourism in Costa Rica uh, since, since 1997. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Mr. Meta, so what's the difference between your job if you're planning a luxury lodge or whatever, I imagine that you work in both spheres. 
uh, what's the difference between a luxury lodge and an eco luxury lodge? Is there a difference? And if so, what is it? There probably is one. And in fact, uh, there is also a difference between a luxury eco lodge and an eco luxury lodge. Da sind wir gespannt zu erfahren, was. <laughs> That sounds really interesting. I think the the um, luxury lodges are those that provide uh, the traditional bells and whistles, but without the ecological and uh, social consciousness. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about uh, flat screen TVs, air conditioning, uh, linens and towels that are washed every single day, uh, telephone showers, mm -hmm. uh, his and hers bathrooms and uh, cabinets. Mm -hmm. And uh, materials that are used are actually resource depleting materials. But when you talk about uh, luxury ecologies, for example, they have all the uh, all of the above. Uh, they have great service. They have great quality in experience, um, and um, they are also helping local communities at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. So they have a strong uh, social and ecological conscience. So we are talking about ecologies, and both of them have mentioned this. But we are talking about uh, conservation of nature surrounding these properties. They are making sure that that's taking place. Wir sind nicht nur Architekt, sind auch Landschaftsarchitekt. So you're not just an architect; you're a landscape architect, I, I gather. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a protected area planner, uh, qualified landscape architect, and also an architect. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so, so for ecologies, for example. You know, we're talking about use of renewable resources, as they've mentioned, solar, thermal, uh, wind. We're talking about rainwater harvesting, water saving technologies. We're talking about the solid waste management, the use of the four R's, reuse, reduce, recycle, and refuse, the four R's. Mm -hmm. And then when you talk about sewage disposal, um, they're making sure that it's not polluting the groundwater. So there is a much more holistic approach when you're talking about luxury ecologies. It's covering everything rather than just the single bottom line. Okay. Yeah. Also bei Ihnen gibt's keine so you don't have flat screen televisions and you probably don't have air conditioning or what what should we imagine? The the a lot of them do not a lot of the ecologies we design do not have that. But that doesn't mean that just because you have air conditioning that you are taken out, because the whole criteria system of what is an eco lodge uh, has been worked on for about 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, the idea is not to get rid of a lot of the people that are doing some great work. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, some of these temperature weather areas are very hot and very humid. So no matter what you do, so in, in, in the financial side is very important. So sometimes you, if you have to do it, that, that's fine. As long as it's non-HFC and you're using, you know, there is an intent, it's important. That would be my next question. What does the uh, luxury lodge look like? That would be my next question. What does the customer, the future user, have to dispense with in a lodge like that? What can't you do? What are, what are the no-nos? Not what you can do without, but it's the extra things that you can do with. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with eco lodges, uh, it's that feel-good factor, the fact that you are actually making a change, right? And you are having these intimate connections with local communities, uh, with the wildlife. You're going with local guides and, and getting sharing their they're sharing their wisdom with you. So these are all the actually things that you get mm -hmm. on top of it. So, in fact, when National Geographic had asked me to write up a one a paragraph definition of eco lodges, luxury lodges, eco lodges. Uh, I actually added a special sentence there. It said it is a property that provides a spiritual communion with nature and culture. That is what makes it very special. Mm -hmm. So actually, guests are getting even more. When something is holistic, it's all encompassing, you are getting a lot more. And you know, it's for the last 10 years now, people have been talking about it. We have what we call the new luxury. Mm -hmm. And the new luxury is like Chumbe Island here. A lot of these long run properties, uh, Cha Creek is another one, right? 
where they are not only talking about commerce, but there is conservation, there is communities, and there is culture. So that is where the new, it's not about stars, but it's about experiential travel mm -hmm. and everything, yeah. Good, that's, um, very sozusagen. Right, and that uh, cue for our next question that we're going to address to the audience. So can we see that on screen, please? So there we are. So looking at your encounter with nature and foreign cultures, what is more important to you when you plan your trip? Is it A, or one, a high-quality sustainability label? Is it uh, the ambience and the engagement of the company in the destination? Or is it uh, online ratings, TripAdvisor ratings? Uh, what will our audience say? Please have your vote. One. Sustainability label, two, the ambience or the environmental information, and three, TripAdvisor ratings. So, what would you say? Yeah, vielen Dank. Thank you. All right, I wouldn't have expected that. Well, that's exciting, isn't it? Well, can I ask Sibylla Ridmiller, how many sustainability labels do you own? Have you have have you have got one at, at all? Number three. Number three is helpful for number two because TripAdvisor is about ratings by the customers, and if customers are saying this is a genuine eco project, well, then obviously uh, visitors have a choice, travelers have a choice, and um, because of number two, they'll come to Chimbu. I mean, I'm sure they will. So question of labels and sustainability labels. Uh, I had no experience because uh, I came through the back door into the tourism industry, so I tried to do some traditional marketing with uh, brochures and advertising. It didn't quite work well. Then I applied for a number of uh, eco awards that are free of charge. So it's actually you apply and you compete with others and you either win it or not. But we've won all the awards out there, by the way, all eco awards. So, Tourism for Tomorrow, Champion of the Earth, um, the Aga Khan Foundation, uh, Agriculture for Tomorrow. There's about 30 awards or more. And you have all them. Uh, now, in the Aga Khan, we didn't win because we're not, we're not Muslim enough. But the experience is that environmental awards use the same criteria as certificates, but they're free of charge. The awards are very powerful in terms of marketing. The World Legacy Award has been uh, given today in a big ceremony, and that was making the headlines. So that's free advertising for you. Now, certification is cost intense. So this is where we need to pay. Uh, in the, Spain, the inspectors, the assessors that come in, and they are, you know, getting, getting getting paid really well, and we have to pay them accommodation as well, and that's expensive for us. So instead, we applied for the awards, and that was really good. The tourism for tomorrow, we got the global award uh, from uh, British Airways, and that uh, brought us a traveling journalist uh, that came in by British Airways. Then they were writing about us in the press. And we got uh, six pages on the British Airways in-flight magazine about Chumbe Islands. Uh, so overnight, our bookings were doubled. So that was really good. Awards are more powerful than the labels. And I'm still believing that this is so. But we are a member, shouldn't we do that? Uh, we are a uh, member of the Long Run. The Long Run is a network of private uh, preservation areas. And also, we have our own certification system, the four Cs. They're called conservation, community, culture, and commerce. And I think that's uh, one of the strictest uh, certification systems out there in the world. So we are, it's a peer-to-peer -peer rating, if you will, an internal rating system. It's a qualification requirement to get into that network, and uh, we are committed to that. But when it comes to marketing, it's been my experience that awards are more important than labels. And um, certifications, obviously, either you market them yourself by you know, making them known, or they're virtually unknown to other people and not uh, decision criteria for our customers. But again, coming back to marketing, for about 10 years now, we're not doing any active marketing anymore ourselves. We don't. Because TripAdvisor is a no-brainer, really. 
But doesn't TripAdvisor cost you money? No, TripAdvisor doesn't cost you anything. It's uh, customer ratings. Of course, yes, you can purchase uh, business uh, services within TripAdvisor to move yourself up in the rating list, uh, but then you'll be marked as a sponsor. So it is, it's truly traveler's ratings. Now, can you explain that again? I'm being told by um, the partners that I work with that TripAdvisor is too expensive. Now, yeah, I mean, that sponsoring link is too expensive for TripAdvisor, and we wouldn't do it. But what you can do, if you're not on the top of the list, uh, you apply for a business or you purchase a business license, and then you can have an online booking feature on TripAdvisor, or you can also get uh, special deals, um, and you move your yourselves up on the uh, TripAdvisor search list. Whenever you look for a destination, you're showing as one of the first hits. But I think the best idea really is to have fascinated customers, and they will give you the ratings. We only have seven bungalows, by the way. We're talking about 5,000 visitors per year, and we're competing with hundreds of beds in large hotels. It's just the number of ratings in TripAdvisors that play a role. So we are competing with the big hotels, and we're always coming up as the first search hits in the best categories. The disadvantage in TripAdvisor in the past was that because we couldn't have any direct links, we didn't pay for them, we had to, uh, to, uh, we had to contact our, or our customers had to contact us on, us on our homepage. But last year, TripAdvisor and Booking.com have teamed up. So we also are listed under Booking.com, 18% of commission, 18% is much cheaper than in TripAdvisor. So if you will, TripAdvisor is virtually irrelevant for us now. Obviously, they are relevant because they attract customers. It's very, tic it's very technical, which means uh, luxury uh, tourism, including composting toilets, work well under TripAdvisor. Well, coming back to an earlier panel question we had where we talked about travel agents, Maybe we are uh, uh, not playing an important role in package tourism, of course, that is true. But only 10% of visitors come through travel agencies. And then they say, when they come, they ask the travel agents, there is no travel agency that offer our services of their own accord. It's the other way around. Travelers go to the travel agency and say, look, we want to go there. We want to go to Tanzania. We want to get a Serengeti, Kilimanjaro, and Chumba package tour. And then they book us. And then we pay 20% or more commission to those travel agencies, although they're not actually marketing us. It's the customers that tell them about us. So we don't like travel agencies, full stop. OK, let me come back, Mr. Alfaro, about target groups in Costa Rica. What are the people that go for luxury holiday in your country who book a rainforest lodge? What is the target group? Where are they from? How much money do they spend? Uh, how much does your services, how much do your services cost? General facts. Um, this uh, luxury uh, ecotourism, it's, it's very popular in European markets. Uh, actually, Germany is a very important market for, for Costa Rica uh, and also certain states of the of, of United States. Um, the, um, their characteristics uh, are that these are uh, very well-educated people. Uh, they have a, a very high income and they do um, uh, take in consideration when they travel, uh, um, nature travel, uh, having authentic experiences, and that's something that they value right now a lot. Uh, sometimes it's not just uh, having an amazing experience. Th that has to be part. We just can't give them an amazing experience and a bad accommodation or, or a bad bed. Uh, that's part of the package. But they do appreciate how going out uh, to the rainforest, uh, getting to know uh, all our animals, getting to know the community, uh, understanding how uh, people live uh, very close to the rainforest or in the middle of the rainforest, uh, and having a very different perspective of life, uh, that's, that's crucial. Also right now, wellness is very popular for us, and, and that's something that we're merging in something that we call a, a wellness pura vida, which is basically having all the, not only the spa, you could have the spa and, and all of these, but you could merge in Costa Rica, uh, for example, uh, mud baths and hot springs or yoga and surfing. So it could be having the, the, the mud bath, but then doing yoga, merging the activity with the wellness uh, in a natural environment, or just uh, having an amazing hike and then have a, an open uh, ceiling um, bath with natural rain. So these are, I'm, I'm saying, things that, that the, the customer 
of these markets uh, really appreciate and their unique experiences that we're selling right now. So in percent, mal ganz grob, wie ist und bei der Preis? In types of percentage, um, what's the price differential between a normal luxury and an eco lodge? Is there any markup? What's the price premium on it? Is that hard to say? It's hard to say because we have a, a lot of these uh, experiences in Costa Rica. It's not that we have like five uh, eco eco lodges. We have different uh, price price ranges, and and it's it's uh, quite uh, we have a big variety of uh, of these hotels in in Costa Rica. Uh, but yeah, it could be it could have a certain markup because also the operation could be more expensive in certain ways. It's more personalized. You have more employees serving uh, each room. Um, but uh, what what the experience tells us and what uh, surveys tell us uh, is that the the clients are uh, happily paying these because they see the value of the experience. So that's the important thing for us. Uh, is this yet? No, Hitish Meter. Is that a boom? Where are things happening? In what parts of the world? Uh, luxury lodges, luxury eco lodges. Where does it happen? Because you know, you're the planner, you're the architect. Where does it happen? It's three, four, three, four. Uh, no, it's. Let me see. Eight, nine years ago, I went on a 46 country tour of the world uh, to identify the most conscientious and some of them luxury properties, but at the same time conscientious. And I found that uh, there were three places, and then of course, of course uh, looking at it over the last seven, eight years, uh, I've seen that Kenya has been amongst the leaders um, in, in these kinds of things. Uh, South Africa is another one in luxury properties. Uh, Ecuador is doing very well. And uh, now there is also more recently, uh, like some of the projects we are doing are with Aboriginal communities in Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has been a big shift now where Aboriginal communities have been given a lot more empowerment. And so now they are taking over and they are uh, creating all of these amazing uh, lodging uh, opportunities. But it's the new luxury. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't compare it with the Ritz Carlton kind of luxury lodge kind of thing, yeah. Is this then, wie das anmoderiert wurde? And is it true, as we heard before, that this is focusing on the tropical regions of the world? Um, or is there, are these segments uh, present in Europe or in Russia or in colder countries? Or is it related to hot climate? Well, if you look at the early 90s when this whole concept really started taking hold, uh, the focus was very much in uh, the tropical countries. Mm -hmm. But over time, you're beginning to see this whole uh, visionary idea uh, going further north and further south. So when I did my book and I'm now working on the second volume, uh, we've got uh, properties that are up in Alaska, uh, up in northern Canada, uh, New Zealand, up in very in Alpine countries. And we're in looking at trying to uh, get more and more of them to show everyone that this whole concept and idea is not only focused to, to tropical ideas. Also, umgekehrt, die westliche. So apparently, the Western world and the Northern Hemisphere is learning from the tropical countries, is learning from the Southern Hemisphere. That's the first world. That's where everything started, was Africa. Everything else. Then. <laughs> yes, mention. From <laughs> Africa. That's true. First people come from Africa. You're right. And there's so many things we could talk about, of course. Uh, you just mentioned your book. You uh, published a book. Um, and I'm sure people can talk to you about that uh, after this session. It's quite interesting because it is a, um, I think it's the luxury lodges that you have developed or you have designed uh, that are shown in that book. Now, Ms. Uh, Reed Miller also has uh, some brochures with her on Chamber Island. And I also uh, and I also understand Costa Rica, not Nicaragua, as I said. Costa Rica has uh, marketing material around. Because unfortunately, unfortunately, we have to start and wrap up. What I think is that uh, we have uh, a major finding here out of our discussion. Why? Values aren't changing. Luxury works in conjunction with uh, sustainability. Also in remote regions of the world, this concept can uh, preserve the environment, preserve nature, and create jobs, by the way. And uh, that is very important for our local communities.
it's no longer um, um, ritzy and glitzy because we had infrastructures, you know, uh, years ago uh, in nature, and we're away f moving away from that. Uh, people have to increasingly recreate authenticity. I rem realize that. Uh, Jochen Zeitz, the founder of Long Run, um, um, he's the uh, Puma CEO, and uh, he has a lot in Kenya where he bought the plane from the Out of Africa movie, and it's in the place there to create that image. But it also is added up with uh, nature conservation. Obviously, that caters to some cliches. I realize that. But this region can only exist thanks to this luxury type of tourism. Now, that's one factor that I think is very important for me also as a consultant. It creates a light bulb effect in the region. I often see that the locals are not aware of, uh, you know, rocky beaches and coral reefs being appealing to foreign travelers. And they really learn that these are the values that they should develop. Same in this part of the world. I mean, if you have visitors from other continents to Germany, they see something else, things that we've never realized exist. So just uh, uh, briefly, Isabella wanted to have the floor, and we really have to wrap up then. We need tourism in order to do nature conservation in the third world. This is no doubt about it. Now, we just, uh, for, for our local communities, that was just rocks and coral reefs. And when they realized how many foreign travelers admire that, something that don't exist in Europe, the Tanzanians, the locals, realize that this is worth protecting. And the same is true for the old historic buildings uh, and the cultural heritage. This is about a way one is raising. It's about education. This is what we need tourism for. Otherwise, people will demolish their old buildings because they don't think they need them anymore. All right, ladies and gentlemen, many thanks indeed to our panelists here. Please, can we have a round of applause? Really good discussion.